<laughs> Thanks. I, so I, I actually wanted to start out with, with a bit of an admission. Um, we, and, and it, after that first set, you, you may not know this, but we were actually trained uh, before <laughs> getting up here. And uh, it was interesting because they trained us in a, in a very <coughs> academic way. They assigned us homework. So we had homework to, to do, and they gave us a book to read. And, you know, I was thinking, oh, this is going to be a stand-up book. It's going to be pretty good. The title was, was inspiring. It was entitled, How to Be a Great Stand-Up Comic, which is <laughs> fucking hilarious. <laughs> but I, I didn't read much of it, and this will be evident as well. <laughs> But I, I did read a spot on page two, which was, was definitely inspiring. And uh, so the author said, don't worry, we were all rubbish for our first 10 or 20 shows. <laughs> oh, and 19 more to go. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, the, I don't know if you, if you got it from the USA chance, but uh, I'm Canadian. <laughs> That I, this is obviously some sort of a Scottish joke because I didn't get it. Uh, but but I, I really have had a lot of trouble understanding the Scottish sense of humor. I, I, I wanted to just put another, other than the training disclaimer, right? Another disclaimer to say if you don't get any of my jokes, it's not at all because you guys have a crap sense of humor. And it's not at all because Canadians have a crap sense of humor. It is solely because my jokes suck, okay? <laughs> Just know that moving forward. Uh, one, one of the, the things that I, I really don't understand more than anything in, in terms of this move to Scotland, and I got here in October, so it's quite recent, uh, is, is the belligerence of the Scottish people. I mean, this whole idea of an independence vote that's going on right now, to have the gall to have an independence vote after all that England did for you. I mean, that's shocking. I mean, Canada would never think of having an independence vote to separate from the United States. I mean, okay, listen, listen. This is not a funny joke, right? I mean, Canadians went down in 1812, we burned down the White House, right? We, we hate Americans, and we certainly don't like being called Americans, so, you know, screw you to the guys in the world. <laughs> I, this, is, this is similar to, to calling a Scotsman English, or an Englishman Welsh, or a Welshman a sheep fucker, right? <laughs> it's just wrong, you don't do it. But anyway, uh, my visa, very explicitly stipulates that I'm not allowed to espouse political commentary, so I should focus on, on what I was brought in to do, which, which is chemistry, right? And uh, one of the biggest challenges I've had since coming here is actually transporting this chemistry from my lab in Canada all the way over here to Edinburgh. And one of the biggest problems I've had is uh, similar to uh, Professor Pullum, who was up here before, is going through this American security border. I mean, this is trying to explain your chemistry to the most paranoid and suspicious people <laughs> in the entire world. <laughs> now, I mean, I, I'm not a professor, right? <laughs> I, I have more than one problem when I cross the border. So I actually am going to talk to you about three different things that I've been subjected to just because, you know, as a, a lowly lecturer level position, I have more strife in my life. <laughs> the first thing I wanted to talk to you guys about was uh, big, strange objects that chemists often carry with them. Um, and it, for a reason I'm not going to explain, uh, I, I was carrying in my, in my luggage, my carry-on luggage, uh, I don't know, it's called a syringe pump. And so this syringe pump is a, a large metal box and it has springs and pulleys and levers and so, you know, to the untrained eye, this is a bomb. <laughs> I mean, it, it's not a bomb, but it's, it's a bomb. <laughs> and so I'm like, oh, I'm not trying to hide a bomb in my luggage, so I will take be proactive, right? Take it out, treat it like a laptop, and put it in its own tray. <laughs> Watch it go through. So, you know, it's in its own tray and it's going through, and before it even gets to the, like, big machine-y thing, you know, a guy comes over to me, he points at it and goes, what the fuck is that? <laughs> I, I'm paraphrasing. <laughs> he came over and he said, sir, what the fuck is that? <laughs> But, so, I, 
and I realized that his big problem isn't because this is some big metal box. It's because I faced the front of the unit towards him and across it, emblazoned in this big sticker, is, says, Not for use on humans. <laughs> So once I explained that during the six-hour flight, I promised I would only use it on animals, he was fine. He was fine. Second thing in terms of problems that I've had is glassware. So as a chemist, a synthetic chemist, we make a lot of things. And we make things in uh, ampules. And these ampules are uh, sort of cylindrical-shaped objects that are made of glass, and they have like a round bit on the end. So these are basically 12 variably-sized glass dildos. <laughs> and, you know, I've, I've had a lot of I've had a lot of trouble explaining the metal box, and so I'm wondering to myself, well, how am I going to pull this off with this burning area? You know, he he'll be thinking to himself, well, why does he need twelve of them? <laughs> why do they need to be different sizes? And why in the fuck would you make it out of glass? <laughs> I mean, isn't that just asking for trouble? <laughs> anyway, I, I get those through, I get those through. Third thing, third thing, and this is the one I was the most worried about. Unknown white powder, right? <laughs> so I've got a container, and it's unlabeled, and there's a kilogram of white powder in it, and it's got a nice little top on it, and I'm just gonna put that through, and it comes out the other end, and they don't say anything to me at all. <laughs> I'm like, I'm really disappointed. I, this was my unknown. I had no idea what it was. I was hoping that they would be able to tell me. <laughs> anyway. I've, I've made it through, right? I'm now here and over and I'm doing chemistry. So what actually are, are we doing? Well, our lab does polymer chemistry. And this is, uh, in layman's terms, we work a lot with plastics. Uh, and in terms of the, the plastics that we use, oftentimes communicating exactly what we do is a bit challenging. I had a student named Donnie, he was my first graduate student in Canada, and he was being interviewed by a reporter. And so he was all excited about this. Oh, you know, my photograph's going to be in the paper. My mom will put it on the fridge. Um, <laughs> and uh, she asks, or the, you know, the reporter asks him, well, you know, what do you do? And, and the student says, well, I synthesize and I characterize polymer stars. <laughs> the reporter looks blankly at, at the student and, you know, something clearly is not getting through. Uh, and so the reporter asks again, okay, well, you know, in the simplest terms you can, what do you actually do? And Donnie thinks, and he says, I synthesize <laughs> and characterize polymer stars. Somehow this was going to magically make it make sense if it was really slow. <laughs> But what we actually do is we make green plastic. So green plastic cups and green plastic lawn chairs and green plastic dildos and green plastic watches. Um, but, but really, this green term isn't necessarily the color of the plastic, but uh, the sustainability behind it. So we work in sustainable plastics, looking at making things that are biodegradable, that are from renewable resources, that are sustainable. And this green term is a way that we can capture a lot of these elements. Uh, now in terms of this, this green polymer sense of what we do, it's not just making simple polymers, we look to control things. And this control happens in, in the lab where I control my students and chain them to the lab bench <laughs> and force them to work 20 hour days. One of them sitting over there, he's, he, I unlocked him this afternoon. <laughs> But this control uh, really captures a lot of work we do on the, on the properties of the polymer. So we look to make things that will melt at certain temperatures or will degrade. And really what we want to do is make all of the lawn chairs in the world totally useless. We want to make the worst <laughs> lawn chairs in the universe. And so we're thinking about this, you know, where do people mostly sit out on plastic furniture? Well, on the, on the beach. And so the temperature is going to be warm. And what we want is to like foil people's sun tanning plants. <laughs> Uh, on hot days, have the, the uh, lawn chair melt, and then they just fall through the sand. But we realized that this wouldn't ruin all markets. I mean, it never gets fucking over 20 degrees here in Scotland. It's not going to work at all. 
So, so then we say, oh, we're going to control the degradation as well. And when it rains, then you know we'll be able to degrade our materials, and you're still going to end up on your ass uh, like if you buy a lawn chair here. So this is this is our goal, really, is to make the worst lawn chairs. In reality, we make things like drug delivery systems and some commodity polymers, but really, what we're doing, and I mean this from the bottom of my heart, is saving the world one green plastic dildo at a time. <laughs>